Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Data-Driven Behavioral Health, Real-World Digital Therapeutics. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping details. Today's webinar is being recorded and an online archive of today's event will be available a few days after the session. If you have trouble seeing the slides at any time during the presentation, please press F5 to refresh your screen on a PC or Command R if you're using a Mac. You may ask a question at any time during the presentation by typing your question into the Q&A box located on the right side of your screen and pressing Enter. And finally, I'd like to remind you of AHIP's antitrust statement located just below the link in the slide viewer. We will, as always, comply with that statement. Among other things, the antitrust statement prohibits us from discussing competitively sensitive information. We're very fortunate to have with us today Demetrius Morosis and Dr. Robert Kyler. As Director of Behavioral Health for Highmark, Demetrius leads a team of licensed mental health professionals and nurses to perform utilization management activities and case management for Highmark's insured lives. He is a creative solution-focused executive leader and clinician with experience providing strategic clinical operational compliance and quality leadership. Dr. Robert Kyler is Chief Clinical Officer of FreeSpira. He is responsible for clinical training and oversight of FreeSpira and supervises a team of licensed clinical assessors and coaches who help deliver FreeSpira as a fully virtual treatment. He has been actively involved in shaping FreeSpira's clinical protocols and outcome studies for over six years, including the landmark publications required by the FDA. He has seen firsthand how FreeSpira helps patients, including, when appropriate, those at his own clinical psychology practice in Houston. At this time, I would like to turn the floor over to our speakers. Welcome. Glad to be Good morning. Here. Very pleased to be with everybody today. Good morning, Demetrius. Good morning, Robert. How are you? I'm terrific. I'm going to briefly uh, go through today's agenda, then we'll dig right into it. Uh, we're going to be talking today about uh, a really uh, exciting and meaningful collaboration between Free Spirit and, and Highmark Health. Uh, we're going to be reviewing a, a pilot program that we did uh, that uh, established Free Spira as a uh, benefit treatment uh, available through Highmark, talking a little bit about uh, current treatments for the conditions that we're approved to treat. Uh, I'll be talking about really kind of the, the why and the how Free Spira is an is a, uh, uh, approved treatment for panic and PTSD and give an overview of the program. We'll talk about our partnership project our results in clinical trials, and then have time for questions and discussion. Demetrius, tell us about the uh, VITAL program and, and how this collaboration came to be. Yeah, so the, the VITAL program is a, is a program within Highmark to test out new technologies, new interventions, and uh, um, the Free Spira was, was uh, um, introduced to the VITALS program, tested, um, and I was introduced to uh, um, the outcomes of that in, in 2017, and the outcomes were, uh, were very favorable. And at that point, I was, uh, I was charged with um, taking the, you know, the favorable outcomes and uh, finding a way to turn them into an available benefit and uh, um, available to our, of our membership. And we were successfully able to do that in May of 2018. And we were able to turn that on for our membership for panic disorder in 2018. And then as post-traumatic stress disorder um, became an approved uh, indication for use, we turned that on in July of 2019 as an available benefit. Uh, we structured it within the, the DME context of the, of the, the members' benefits and uh, recently um, adjusted our uh, contractual relationship to also contemplate uh, sort of tele telehealth channel of coaching delivery um, to, so that could be available to our membership. Uh, we did that in, in January of this year. Great, thank you. Well, one of the things that, that was really kind of instrumental uh, in this progress uh, going forward was a study that was a collaboration between 
Highmark, Allegheny Health Network, and Freespira. Uh, and this was a, a pilot program through the vitals uh, that made Freespira available to people suffering with uh, panic disorder uh, who were being treated within the Allegheny Network. And there was really a twofold project. And, and one aspect was to uh, look at progress and symptomatic reduction for people who undertook this treatment. We'll be talking about the treatment in some more detail in a little bit, but it's a 28-day treatment that essentially teaches people how to breathe in a healthy way. We'll talk about uh, essentially the physiologic factors uh, that are associated, but in this 28-day treatment, we had a very, very substantial clinical response um, with uh, the vast majority of people who were enrolled in this project, who, by the way, had a long history of uh, recurrent panic attacks before joining this project, um, and found really substantial clinical benefit. Uh, and then, in addition to the clinical benefit that was tracked, Highmark uh, tracked uh, uh, any reason medical spending. Demetrius, would you talk a little bit about the uh, the change in medical spending that was uh, uh, associated with this free spirit treatment. Yeah, we saw we saw a reduction in uh, um, overall medical spend, and and what was remarkable is that uh, uh, the most significant reduction in in uh, in medical spend um, was in sort of the uh, you know a, a blend of between sort of the pharmacy costs and the uh, uh, emergency department uh, um, reductions. Um, and 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 as I sort of mentioned earlier, the you know the, the testing within our our integrated health network and and sort of the, the credibility of those that were at the at the forefront of the testing, um, along with these sort of outcomes that uh, that we saw, uh, were significant and and really drove us to uh, operationalize it and, and make it more broadly available to all of our membership. A little bit of a backdrop, we'll get into this in some more detail, but people with recurrent panic attacks really uh, have a, a, a very uh, rapid and scary onset of symptoms, uh, chest pain, shortness of breath, tremulousness, dizziness, uh, that often leads people naturally to think first about a medical condition and not a psychological condition. And one of the things we know from the literature as well as from this project that people who are having these recurrent panic attacks uh, have really substantial uh, medical spending, really out of proportion to their, uh, their general medical health. And, and so that's where we saw this really significant reduction in medical spending in the one year post-treatment. Uh, and we think that's because if, if people are no longer having these frightening physiological symptoms, they are much less likely to be going to the emergency room thinking that they're having a cardiac event going to a cardiologist, going to their primary care condition. And, and so uh, th that's really kind of where we, where we see a direct link between symptom reduction and, and medical spending. And on the basis of that, uh, uh, Demetrius, that, that was uh, really kind of the core of this decision to uh, make a uh, medical policy uh, creating a, a pathway for routine payment for Freespira as a covered benefit, correct? And that's correct, Bob. So yeah, the first thing we did was uh, um, really look for medical policy support. Um, and our medical policy team um, went through their, their typical process of, of vetting the, uh, um, the data, um, pursuing sort of external review of, of those results, and subsequently, uh, you know, recommending um, that uh, we can open this to uh, panic disorder. And then we went through the same process again um, in 2019 for the pursuit of post-traumatic uh, uh, stress disorder. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see if I can get our next slide up here. And Demetrius, uh, would you talk a little bit about kind of how this coverage fits in the overall landscape of behavioral health directions for Highmark? Yeah, so, so um, within Highmark, we're certainly interested in uh, um, looking for all the opportunities to integrate and, uh, and, and look for those, uh, you know, integrate behavioral health with sort of, you know, physical health. 
um, you know, it, it's quite clear that uh, unmanaged, undermanaged, uh, incompletely managed uh, behavioral health needs will certainly drive and uh, um, sort of create a ceiling of outcomes for physical health uh, needs. And so this goal of integrating and, and, and uh, blending our interventions um, to look at um, sort of total member outcomes, whole person outcomes. So as a result, uh, we're looking for uh, opportunities to increase uh, you know, access for those uh, you know, behavioral health driven themes um, in sort of unique and innovative and very focused ways. Um, um, so we, you know, we, we look at, uh, um, you know, sort of the, you know, that connection between mind and body, so the crisis support. Uh, um, we look for, um, you know, managing the sort of the, the, the social determinants of health drivers that a, that a member would present. Uh, we look at, uh, um, uh, you know, our, our membership and their, uh, uh, you know, sort of their risks of sort of self-harm, the, the implications of sub substance use disorder, um, and, uh, you know, depression and anxiety. Uh, and, and we're constantly looking for solutions um, to, you know, blend that and to support our, you know, our care management and our case management uh, uh, teams, um, as well as our providers. Uh, so these members are being seen by our, our providers' primary care and giving them an opportunity because they're the ones that have the relationship with the members. They're the ones who are seeing and pursuing what looks like physical symptomatology and uh, pursuing that in a sort of a physical health kind of lens. And, uh, um, and we, we look to you know, augment that and uh, where a behavioral health intervention is possible, likely um, we're, in, you know, we're educating our providers that these options are available for Highmark membership. Thank you. And one of the things that's also, uh, unfortunately, in our landscape today uh, is the COVID pandemic. And one of the things that, that really turned out to be fortuitous uh, in this project is that Freespira is an intervention that can be delivered uh, completely virtually. And uh, we know that COVID has really been responsible for really notable increases in health anxiety, uh, in general anxiety symptoms, as well as panic symptoms and traumatic exposure in, in the course of uh, 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 the, the impact of the COVID pandemic. Uh, and so Freespira uh, can be a completely use at home intervention where people can be authorized by a clinician virtually, and then the treatment can be done completely virtually. The system is sent to a patient's home. We'll give you a little more detail about that in a few moments, uh, but it is a it is a uh, an intervention uh, that can be done entirely in the safety uh, of the individual's home. Uh, so that solves some of the significant access problems that were certainly true before the pandemic, but have been, been really accentuated by uh, the various shutdowns that have been associated. I'm going to talk a little bit about these conditions, and there's some of the things that are, are, are really not really very well recognized about the impact of the two conditions that were approved to treat, which is uh, recurrent panic or panic disorder and PTSD. Uh, there was a World Health Organization study that was done, uh, published several years ago that looked at the impact on daily life functioning, what's called days out of role, which means the inability to perform your, your regular life functions. Uh, and what really stood out is that panic and PTSD uh, were the most life impairing conditions of all. And if you see our numbers here, 45 days per year out of roll for panic, 42 for PTSD. And those were above, uh, really, really quite strikingly above other conditions such as cancer, diabetes, chronic pain, and such. Uh, so that uh, it's really kind of under recognized that these behavioral health conditions have really massive impact on individuals' ability to perform daily life function, really uh, greater than some of the major medical conditions that we usually think of uh, as having some of the highest health burdens of any. To talk a little more about panic and PTSD, 
uh, access uh, is, a, is a real problem. We know this was a problem prior to the pandemic, um, but we see uh, very, very high rates of emergency room utilization in panic. Um, we see uh, uh, low rates comparatively of people actually seeking treatment because of those access problems. Rates in this country, even prior to the pandemic, are pushing 20% of the population for anxiety disorders. When you look at panic and PTSD together, you're really looking at, at some, somewhere like 10% of our total adult population as being significantly affected by these conditions. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, a, a real life circumstance. Uh, this happens to be uh, a, an athlete that, that I treated. He is a Highmark beneficiary. Uh, he was a uh, major league uh, uh, baseball player. Actually, he was in the minors at the point that I saw him, uh, played catcher and was really incapacitated by recurrent panic attacks. Uh, the uh, league's uh, behavioral health officer contacted me and said there's a player who would like to avail himself of the free spirit treatment. And so I uh, walked him through the treatment. Uh, he was an individual who was uh, under tremendous pressure, uh, as you might imagine, uh, you know, being in the minor leagues, looking to be on the brink uh, in his professional athletic career, uh, and his recurrent panic attacks uh, were really almost incapacitating. Uh, at, at, as he anticipated getting on the field each day, uh, he was uh, just under intense pressure. Nausea, interestingly, was uh, one of the real strongest aspects uh, of this. Uh, maybe not surprisingly, as an athlete who's learned how to use his body, uh, he learned the breathing technique that we teach, and I'll talk about it just a little bit. Uh, he, he began to have a really rapid symptomatic improvement. And what was really very interesting is, as he and I uh, worked along in the therapeutic month, he reached out to me and said that he had made a decision to leave baseball and go back to college. And he said it took a clarity of mind that the daily pressure had to recede once he was getting significant benefit. Uh, before he was able to kind of come to grips uh, with this decision. Uh, and he decided to leave baseball and it was very interesting. He, he told me that uh, a couple of days after he made that decision, he was at the breakfast table and started laughing and he could not quite figure out why until he realized it was the first day in ages that he had not started his day by throwing up and the relief uh, of uh, having the symptomatic load uh, go down uh, and the clarity of mind to make a decision that it was time for him to go back uh, to college. Uh, so we considered himself, you know, and usually I was concerned to hear that this athlete had decided to drop out of baseball, but he considered it really a, a very, very important life decision and a positive life decision for him. As we talk about kind of uh, our numbers in general, he's kind of an example of a positive treatment. So we're gonna talk now a little bit about how panic and PTSD present. So what's really not widely known is that there's a common physiologic factor uh, that's associated with both of these conditions. There's been a developing scientific literature from about the past 30 years uh, that looks at differentiating these conditions from others. So we see panic related conditions as really somewhat different from your general kind of anxiety disorders, and it's this really strong physiologic presentation that's associated. Uh, the scientists who really developed this literature developed a concept that's called carbon dioxide hypersensitivity, which creates kind of the, a, a body churned up and, and ready to go into panic mode. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's sort of an underlying condition that combined with risk factors in general life uh, create this, this risk factor for developing panic and PTSD. There's a very interesting uh, uh, technique that's used in the laboratory called a carbon dioxide challenge test. If you take people with panic related conditions, including PTSD, and give them a single inhalation of carbon dioxide enriched air, it provokes panic attacks on the spot. Interestingly, in people with PTSD, it can provoke post-traumatic flashbacks. 
uh, and other, uh, you know, other of the, the kind of PTSD symptoms. Uh, and Prespira was really developed to help people learn how to breathe in a healthy fashion, to breathe differently, that would reduce this, uh, this risk of uh, this kind of symptom surge that's associated with these conditions. And where does free spirit kind of fit in the landscape of other, uh, of other available treatments? The prevailing treatments for these conditions are psychotherapy and psychotropic medication. I'm a psychotherapist, I've been doing it for many, many years. Uh, and one of the things that's a complication with my profession uh, is that access to specifically trained professionals is really kind of limited. Uh, oftentimes people are looking at significant weights to first appointments. Uh, they may or may not get somebody who is specifically trained in, in working with these conditions. Um, and it tend to be a long duration and expensive treatment. When we look at psychotropic medications, antidepressants and benzodiazepines are the primary treatments, uh, medication treatments that are used. Uh, and one of the complications, antidepressants are really the preferred treatments for both panic and PTSD when we're talking about medications but they're high side effect burdens with medications and associated with those, uh, those side effects are high discontinuation rates. We also know that even people who are successfully treated are at high risk of relapse of symptom, uh, symptoms uh, re-emerging, even if they've been successfully treated within a year or so of discontinuation. When we talk about the benzodiazepines for treatment of panic, there's a high risk of uh, abuse or even addiction with these medications, and that's really problematic. Both panic and PTSD have high rates of substance use. Uh, upwards of 25% of people will uh, develop substance abuse problems uh, associated uh, with these medications. Prespira uh, is a uh, technique that teaches people how to breathe in a healthy fashion, uh, and so the side effects are really minimal uh, they are uh, sometimes a little bit of shortness of breath in the first few sessions, but the uh, effectiveness rates are high. Most people have really striking symptomatic reduction within a fairly short period of time. We'll talk a little, a little bit about our clinical trials. And compliance and adherence rates are very high. Uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, it can be done completely virtually. And it's a relatively short uh, treatment. It's a 28-day start-to-finish treatment uh, that involves twice daily practice. And this is what Free Spira looks like. On the right-hand side, you see the Free Spira system, which is a simple respiratory sensor. Uh, the patient breathes through a nasal cannula, and the sensor measures their breath-to-breath -breath exhaled carbon dioxide levels and respiratory rate, and by Bluetooth, sends that information to a screen that guides the patient through a twice daily breathing session. The ask for an individual patient is relatively simple. Uh, they're instructed to, re to breathe in sync with a rising and falling audio tone. In other words, to learn how to pace their breathing because most people with these conditions breathe with some really significant respiratory irregularities. They tend to breathe fast, they tend to breathe irregular, they breathe with their upper chest and not with their diaphragm. They may hold their breath. They may sigh. They may yawn. And these are the kind of respiratory dysregulation that's associated with these conditions. They also get a breath-to-breath -breath measure of their exhaled carbon dioxide levels, which tend to be low with these conditions, particularly with panic. And their job is to adjust their breath volume in order to normalize their CO2 level. There's also really strong data analytic capacity that goes along with this program. Uh, all of the data is ported to the company's uh, secure server. So we are able to see whether a patient has done a session, whether they have completed the session. Uh, we are able to look at their uh, physiologic data. Uh, there's an assigned health coach that goes along with each patient that coaches them through the experience so the coach is able to see the, the patient's uh, progress towards targets and uh, provide encouragement, support, and education to help them hit those goals. Uh, we also have embedded symptomatic measures, so we are able to track the severity of the condition at the beginning of treatment and their improvement through the course of treatment. So that telehealth coaching, data analytic, and real-time biofeedback are really kind of the three essential components of this treatment.
there's been substantial published research uh, done with this particular protocol, and this is a slide that shows uh, really uh, a summary of three independent studies. Uh, there was an original study that was done at Stanford University that established the protocol that Prespira is based on. Uh, there was another center you see in our maroon graph uh, that was done at five different anxiety treatment centers around the country. And then uh, the, the tan one on the right is the allegheny Highmark collaboration. And so what we see here is a population pre-treatment that has a moderately severe to severe panic condition. That score of around 15 with the panic disorder severity scale shows that people are having frequent and recurrent panic attacks, uh, that they go through a lot of avoidance behaviors. We see people who will not drive on the freeway, who will not get on an airplane, who avoid crowded situations because these are uh, situations that provoke panic symptoms. So at, at the beginning of treatment, it's a population uh, that came into this, uh, to these three different independent studies with about a 10-year history of this disorder. Uh, really all had been treated with other methods without sufficient response. And then after 28 days, what you see in the middle is a symptom reduction that's gone from about 15 to about five. That score of around five on the panic disorder severity scale shows that symptoms have basically reduced almost to the point of remission, i.e. that the person would no longer be considered to have the disorder. And then what was really striking to me when I first began looking at this data is that when outcomes are measured out to a full year post-treatment, uh, that the treatment benefit has not only continued, in some instances, it, it's really increased some more. And, and that's really a, a striking kind of maintenance of benefit for a single episode treatment. In none of these circumstances did the person have access to the free spirit device uh, or coaching post-treatment. And so that 28-day treatment is really responsible for this substantial and enduring improvement uh, in their conditions. And what we see here also, uh, this is in the, the Highmark study, uh, that the, the people who participated uh, really began as young adults. And that's what's also notable about panic and PTSD is that these are conditions that tend to get established uh, in late adolescence and early adulthood. Uh, and for most people, they end up being chronic conditions. So these are people who are in the prime of their lives uh, who are then uh, affected for a long duration. And what really is striking in the clinical trials uh, is that young population with really significant clinical conditions have uh, really substantial uh, improvement uh, within a uh, four-week time period and maintain that improvement out to a measured year. And Bob, this, this is Demetrius, if, if I could also add, um, we've also sort of seen those results um, supported um, after the study um, since we've gone live as well. Yes, thank you. And that's, that's an, another really important part of our uh, collaboration. So one of the other things, when we look at, at Highmark members, again, post-treatment, uh, adherence rates are very high, 74 to 77%. Uh, that's a very, very high adherence rate for use at home therapeutic. Uh, and what we also see when we look at Highmark members, uh, this is 500 plus patients after this initial pilot, uh, is this really substantial reduction in their panic and PTSD scores post-treatment. Uh, over 50% for people with panic disorder and 43% for uh, people with PTSD. So those are really significant symptomatic reductions uh, for these populations. And Demetrius, if you would talk a little bit about uh, the uh, project uh, that's underway at this point to really continue to look at the uh, uh, at the benefits uh, of this intervention. Yeah, well, one, one of the one of our interests was, you know, so I mean, we did a lot of sort of descriptive work and uh, sort of you know med econ driven work in terms of cost reduction, um, but we never truly had you know the you know the statistical power that we were interested in. 
and uh, we now have enough members that have uh, undergone the treatment. Uh, we've continued the uh, you know the MedEcon analysis and continue to see sort of favorable um, you know you know medical economic kind of results um, from those at least of those members that uh, pursue the treatment. And uh, uh, we were still interested. And since we have enough members, our, our, uh, our sample size is adequate. Uh, we're in the midst of a matched pairs analysis, um, looking for uh, you know sort of in-depth um, outcomes and uh, and and getting that uh, that statistical power behind this. Uh, we don't have a control group in the traditional sense, um, but with the uh, um, sort of the volume of members and data that we have available. Uh, we've identified uh, uh, 500 plus members that have pursued the treatment and have a tail of data in terms of post-treatment um, and we're in the process of that uh, match pairs analysis and hopefully we'll have results here um, by month's end. Uh, and we're looking at, uh, you know, once again, as I said before, with our MedEcon, we're, we're certainly sort of seeing a, a, a valuable uh, ROI. Uh, cost reduction in terms of, uh, you know, pharmaceutical ED utilization is a sort of primary. And uh, we're sort of seeing total medical spend uh, reduce in, in such a way that uh, this is favorable. And, and uh, um, we're certainly continuing and looking for ways to expand and uh, create pathways for members that uh, um, are that's easier. Thank you. You know, we we end up in presentations like this often talking about the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the metrics and the data. And I really kind of see this as a, uh, as really kind of a rare win-win kind of situation in behavioral health. You know, the metrics that we're talking about of overall reduction of, of medical spending, you know, I'm at the individual level with my patients and what I have often seen are people coming in and in some instances have been told repeatedly by a variety of physicians that their, their physical health is actually quite good. Uh, but uh, I've had patients that I've started on Free Spirit who come in wearing a halter monitor because they continue to have these frightening sensations of shortness of breath or a racing heartbeat. And they go from doctor to doctor uh, asking for an answer. And many times they are given lots of testing. They're given lots of medications. They're passed to other specialists uh, until finally somebody says, you know, we've checked you out in many, many ways. Uh, and so at the, you know, at, at the plan level, we see a tremendous amount of expense. At the individual patient level, we have somebody who's really experiencing a terrifying situation. For those of you who uh, have never had a panic attack, it, it might be a bit hard to imagine, but it's, uh, it's abrupt, it's terrifying. People often feel like they're about to die, and what do they do? They go to the hospital, they go to their doctor, and at the health plan level, it's an awful lot of money being spent, sometimes not to very uh, positive outcomes, but at the individual level, it can really be uh, incapacitating. People restrict their lives in all sorts of ways. Uh, they uh, uh, may really underperform professionally because they are afraid of being in situations where they may be called on to present. They go to the doctor frequently, they avoid travel. Uh, and so it's really kind of a life incapacitating uh, uh, condition. Uh, and in, in the process, uh, they spend an awful lot of health plan money, but uh, at the individual level, uh, it's really a miserable, mis miserable condition. And so, you know, in my position as a clinician to see people in a relatively brief period of time go from intensely symptomatic to symptom free uh, is uh, very, very gratifying to me, but life changing for some of the people who have these kinds of outcomes. Yeah, so so, Bob, I mean, one, one of the things I'd like to highlight is, is uh, you know, we certainly are seeing favorable results and that's sort of why we're uh, uh, sticking with Free Spira, promoting Free Spira. And uh, so part of, part of the promotion is sort of, once again, greater integration of presenting this to our provider community. Um, they're, they're the ones facing our membership. They're the ones with the relationship to our membership. They're the ones 
addressing those emergency department visits. Those they're the ones trying to determine what the next pharmacological treatment option may be. And this is an option that uh, we're looking to present to them and using multiple channels of, of that presentation. Um, and it's also most useful to our providers who are in value-based reimbursement uh, relationships, um, especially where um, you know pharmacy spend and, and uh, ED spend and things like that are, are calculated as part of those outcomes. Um, so we're certainly getting attention that way and looking to keep this sort of in the forefront of, uh, of an available treatment option for our, for our membership. You know, at that qualitative level, uh, our health coaches uh, brought up some of the quotes from Highmark members, uh, and we're having those on the screen for you. So one individual says, I feel like Free Spirit has given me my normal back. Another says, I fall asleep easier and actually wake up feeling refreshed. Uh, it's not at all unusual for panic and PTSD to have really significantly disrupted sleep. Uh, I have seen some patients who have had a resolution of their traumatic nightmares, uh, which is a, a really life impairing aspect of PTSD. Uh, another member on our right hand side says, um, I, I thought I will always feel awful if I needed to drive. Now I can drive my kids places uh, and I'm more comfortable. My heart doesn't race and now I don't dread uh, driving in the way that I used to. You can imagine how incapacitating it might be. I live in Houston, Texas, having clients uh, who will only get on the access road or the freeway because they are terrified when they get on the highway uh, that they will have a panic uh, episode, that they may crash, uh, that they may be uh, just overwhelmed by their panic and unable to drive safely and to have that resolve. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's easy to read those words, but uh, until you uh, see the difference in an individual who's now able to uh, navigate life, not only navigate the freeway, but navigate life uh, panic-free, it's, it's really substantial. And uh, I understand we've got uh, good numbers of uh, questions, so we're really uh, interested in, in uh, hearing from you in ways that we can tell you more about uh, what we do and why. Thank you. So we're going to go ahead and transition into our Q&A phase, and we appreciate your questions. As a reminder, you can certainly ask questions at any time by typing your questions into the Q&A box located on the right-hand side of your screen and clicking Enter. So we have several questions that have come in, and the first one I would like to uh, <clears throat> address to you is, is the device prescribed by a provider? If so, is uh, is the limited is it limited to certain medical specialists? Also, are there medical nece uh, necessity criteria to be eligible for this device? I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, this, this is Demetrius. So I'll sort of start the start the response if if I, if I could, Bob. Um, so, you know, a, a provider um, would not necessarily need to prescribe it as much as uh, um, indicate that the that that member is matching the the clinical indications of a panic disorder and post traumatic stress disorder, um, and uh, there's no authorization uh, required from the health plan standpoint, and so there's not a medical necessity uh, uh, review um, during that process. Now, uh, Prespira certainly does a a, a match, and 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 Robert, you can. Uh, uh, clarify that a bit further, but they, they do clarify that they're matching this device for the clinical indications that the, uh, the FDA has, uh, has cleared them for. Yes, thank you. So uh, the, the regulatory requirement uh, is that Freespira be authorized by a healthcare professional. So it does not have to be a physician. Um, so uh, any healthcare professional holding a license in that state can authorize from that standpoint. It's not a prescription, as Demetrius said, can authorize use. Uh, the other thing is that uh, from a company standpoint, we wanna make sure that we're treating people who have the conditions that we're approved to treat and that we know we can be effective for. So we've got uh, authorizing professionals uh, that are contracted with the company as well as clinicians that, for example, may come from the Highmark network uh, who are able to evaluate a patient 
and determine whether they have a panic or a PTSD condition. We use the standard uh, self-report questionnaires, the panic disorder severity scale and the PCL5 for PTSD, because we want to know that they have a condition that we can treat. There's no good reason to believe that somebody who has a major depressive disorder without panic uh, or OCD would be, uh, would be uh, effectively treated by this intervention. So we are screening people in by determining that they have the conditions. Uh, and we're also recommending that people go elsewhere if there is a condition that we don't have any good reason to believe that we would be effective uh, in treating. So uh, thank you. So uh, uh, our next question, please. Thank you. Our next question uh, reads, did you have a control group? In the initial study, uh, we, we did not have a control group. And that's why we're uh, at this point uh, um, with the sample size that we have available of those treated using the balance of our, uh, of our Highmark membership to do a matched, you know, uh, control group analysis, uh, a matched group analysis, and uh, sort of doing this in, a, in sort of a retrospective uh, sense. And I'll add a little bit to that. We've discussed some of the research that's been published. The original Stanford project uh, used a randomized waitlist control uh, and found that people who were on the waitlist had no improvement during their panic, uh, during their waitlist period, who had a rapid response once they began to use the intervention. The studies since then have been open label, uh, so they have not used a randomized control design, but we have what's called redundant validity. We've got five published studies uh, all showing very, very similar patterns of responses. Uh, we are in the process right now of uh, working with an anxiety treatment uh, uh, organization uh, that will uh, use a, uh, a, a psychotherapy control group, uh, but our published studies to date uh, have been open label rather than using randomized controls. And next question, please. Thank you. The next question reads, does the device capture or store any data that correlates with engagement to validate that the member is using the device? Uh, yeah, great question. So uh, as soon as the patient finishes a session, this is a 17-minute session that they do twice daily, immediately at completion, uh, the data is ported to the company's secure server. So we can see that the patient did a session. We can see when it was. We can see that they completed the session uh, and we can see their physiologic metrics. And so that at the session to session label, uh, label, uh, you know, uh, we are able to see whether a session has been completed. Uh, and we also measure uh, adherence for that individual as well as for groups. So, for example, we can go in, we can report to Demetrius, uh, you know, Demetrius, your members have any 75 percent adherence rate. So our data at our data capture. Uh, is able to uh, look at that individual as well as the aggregate level uh, that uh, the patients have been using it as directed, have been completing sessions, uh, have made positive changes in their breathing style as well as changes in their symptoms. And next question, okay. please. Thank, thank you. Um, Upon completion of the 28-day treatment cycle, is the device returned? Yeah, the device is really used to be uh, refurbished and sent back out again. Uh, so it's really, uh, it, it's really sent out on what you would call almost a lease basis. So it's sent directly to the patient's home. Uh, they are trained on its use by one of our health coaches. And then uh, there is a uh, prepaid mailer, so the patient sends it back to the, back to the company. Uh, and what we have, have just recently uh, made available uh, uh, is a, essentially a, an app that gives uh, alumni, so to speak, the pacing tones that they are able to continue to practice if they so desire the kind of paced breathing that we're teaching. A lot of my patients tell me that after a couple of weeks, they are able to be aware when their breathing is getting dysregulated. So, for example, if they feel themselves breathing from their upper chest instead of their belly, they can kind of shift into that overlearned breathing style. People also tell us repeatedly that when they're in triggering situations, that they are able to uh, maintain the paced breathing, and it really seems to ward off uh, the, the symptom onset that used to go with kind of triggering circumstances. 
And next question, please. The next question reads, is this treatment available for people that have PTSD along with COPD? Uh, good question. Um, advanced COPD is a contraindication. Uh, people with, with advanced COPD have damaged lungs and their exhaled CO2 levels typically are very high rather than low. Uh, and so someone who has PTSD and early stage COPD, we ask for a clearance by their personal physician to make sure that their lung health is sufficient. Uh, this is an area that we are going to be exploring in another collaboration, uh, whether we can really demonstrate benefit for people with early stage COPD. Uh, I'll also mention we are working with the same group uh, with a, a look at people with long haul COVID, many of whom who have panic-like or PTSD symptoms. Uh, and so we really want to have that close collaboration with medical professionals for people who have significant uh, lung impairment associated with COPD or with, with long haul COVID. And next question, please. Thank you. Um, the next question reads, what role do the providers play? So is, uh, are they the connection point to ensuring the success of adoption and use by the member? Yeah, the, the providers uh, the providers can be that uh, that initial connection, um, and and at Highmark we also have uh, network providers who have opted to be trained in the implementation and the and the coaching on the use of the device, and within that context um, they are able to sort of continue the the relationship and rapport. So whether those are behavioral health clinicians, primary care physicians. Um, you know, they're able to uh, um, sustain that and do their, do their own coaching. What we discovered is that uh, um, not many, you know, clinicians were, uh, you know, reaching out for that, and that was a bit of a bottleneck for us, and that's why one of the reasons, and, you know, we expanded to, uh, you know, have Freespira available um, to deliver the coaching um, in, a, in a very structured way. Um, but network providers can certainly be trained um, to do that and uh, coach their patients during this four-week course of treatment. Thank you, Demetrius. You know, one other thing that I would add to that, you know, as an as a individual practitioner, uh, Freespira often works best uh, if the company's health coaches do it, so it really keeps the practitioner uh, in their sweet spot doing what they do, which is, you know, the practice of uh, psychology or social work or psychiatry. Uh, and what our team does is it provides uh, progress reports. It can be weekly if the practitioner uh, requests or end of treatment so that we keep them in the loop. Our health coaches, if they see anything that concerns them about the health or stability of the member, will reach out to the referring clinician uh, and have a collaboration. Uh, what we find is that uh, most of the clinicians uh, really prefer that collaborative uh, kind of relationship with us where they are kept posted about their patients' uh, progress and given an end of treatment report and can rely on our health coaches to reach out to them if there's anything of concern that, that, that uh, imagines. Thank you. Next question reads, are you able to work up to the 17 minutes, for example, five minutes for five days, 10 minutes for five days? What is the uh, what is the breathing pattern? What is the regulated breathing? Um, have you also tested yeah. with comorbid TBI? And what is the overall benefit of using free spirit versus just teaching specific breathing techniques? That was one long question. There you go. Wow. That's a, that, that, that's a, that's a long question. Hey, why don't you, why don't you start me again? So I'll start off actually with the first. Uh, the the okay. protocol that we use, because we are, you know, an FDA, uh, you know, regulated and cleared, uh, we use the protocol that the FDA approved, and that is a 17-minute uh, session. For two minutes, we take a simple baseline. The patient just kind of sits comfortably and breathes, uh, and so we are able to see what their respiration style is like at rest. Then for 10 minutes, they breathe with a rising and falling audio tone, uh, watching their, their, uh, their CO2 level, uh, and they change their respiratory volume, the depth of their breathing to normalize their CO2. And then for five minutes, there's basically an unwind. 
uh, where the audio tones go away, their job is to maintain their respiratory stability without the, uh, uh, you know, without the audio pacing. So uh, no, it is a 17 minute protocol. Um, we're really not inclined to tinker with that protocol because our adherence rates are very high, which means that most people do this satisfactorily and comfortably uh, and they do it through the 28 day period and they have a very high chance of having uh, really significant symptomatic improvements. So to that extent, we, we are not tweaking what's, uh, you know, uh, a system that's working very, very well. Uh, over the course of the 28 days, uh, the patient changes their respiratory rate. That's basically guided by the system. They start with a relatively fast 13 respirations per minute. By the final uh, uh, week, they are breathing at six respirations per minute. So they are learning kind of a meditative breathing style, uh, but it's guided by, by this biofeedback kind of protocol. Uh, and then uh, there was a question about TBI, I think. Can you uh, refresh that for me? Yes, have you tested with comorbid TBI? We have really not tested. We have had uh, we've had, you know, an occasional patient who reports TBI. Uh, we really don't have enough data to be able to tell you uh, one way or the other. What we've known uh, just kind of qualitatively for uh, uh, some people with traumatic brain injury, they need some really more detailed coaching uh, because of concentration or focus difficulties. And so that's where our health coaches can kind of individualize the care based on the condition of the client. Again, the very last part of that question is, what is the overall benefit of using the free spear versus just teaching specific breathing techniques? Uh, interesting question. So healthy breathing is, is really kind of a good thing. We know that there's really kind of widespread, uh, you know, recommendations for doing kind of meditative breathing and mindfulness. Uh, in a way, we are kind of a technology-assisted breathing modality. Prespira is the only intervention that we are aware of that uses measurement of CO2 levels uh, as part of the breathing instruction. And again, when we talked about specificity, about treating panic and PTSD, we know these are conditions that are, uh, you know, that are associated with this kind of breathing dysregulation, this carbon dioxide hypersensitivity. Uh, so that we're really kind of tailored towards those conditions. There was a really interesting study that came out of the UK that looked at a very elegant kind of gamified breathing uh, device that was uh, that was used for people with panic disorder, uh, and they used a kind of a, a very similar uh, uh, respiratory stabilization to free spira, but they did not have any measurement of CO2 levels. And what's interesting is that study after 28 days demonstrated no impact, no improvement in panic conditions. And by contrast, we've got multiple studies that showed uh, a, a, about a 10-point reduction in the panic disorder severity scale compared to a one-tenth of a point reduction in this other study. So although it's not, a, uh, you know, uh, it, it's not an exact uh, control condition, uh, it's an indication that we have from the literature uh, that this feedback of CO2 level uh, appears to be a really, really essential ingredient uh, in the improvement for people with panic conditions. Thank you. Um, the next question reads, is this treatment available for veterans? Uh, yes, it is. We are uh, approved as part of the schedule uh, in the VA. Uh, and so uh, we are considered a medical device from the VA. Uh, it has to be prescribed by a VA uh, uh, physician uh, or practitioner uh, if it's going to be approved in the VA. Uh, we've got groups right now that are working with individual VA centers. Uh, and so if, if anybody has a question, they are happy to reach out to us. We have a government relations coordinator uh, that would uh, help give you uh, information about how to access through a particular VA center. Thank you. Next question reads, how do you account for the member's experience while using machine? For example, the environment, distractions, how, or how they were feeling that day? Uh, can you ask the, the second part of that question? I, 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 it was not exactly clear to me. 
Uh, sure. So how do you account for the member's experience uh, while they are using the machine? For example, the environment they're using it in, distractions around them, or how they might have been feeling that day? Uh, great. So that's where our, our health coaching comes in. Uh, the initial session is a 45-minute uh, secure video coaching where we uh, really coach the patient through how to use this system optimally. And that is free from distractions, being in a private, quiet place, uh, not having other devices on. The little tablet computer that we used uh, does not allow text to go through, um, uh, you know, or, uh, or, or people to be looking at emails or videos. So we really ask people to concentrate on uh, their breathing during this 17-minute uh, session. Uh, our coaches also check in regularly with our clients if they see a problem uh, with adherence or with uh, lack of progress. They are on the phone or on video with that client, really learning about their circumstances. Uh, so that's really where that kind of individualized coaching comes through. I I'll tell you what we hear from a lot of people uh, is within the first five to seven to ten days, most people are describing a subjective benefit. And there's nothing that promotes adherence and keeping up what's working uh, as having early indications of success. One of the things, you know, this is a period where most people who are taking medications are experiencing side effect long before they experience benefit. So we think some of that early benefit that people are experiencing is what's really promoting people to practice regularly uh, and to uh, maintain themselves in that kind of calm, focused environment for maximum success. The next question reads, so in terms of clinical pathways, where will free spirit sit in the hierarchy of treatments uh, for PTSD or panic disorder in a large health plan system? So would it be equivalent to tier one? Demetrius, maybe you, you uh, start us on that. Yeah, I, I think it's really going to be dependent on the, uh, on the clinician's assessment of, uh, of, of need. And, uh, um, you know, one of, one of the reasons that, uh, you know, Highmark is making this available is really that, uh, you know, in, in some cases, a, um, you know, any sort of intervention and initial success at that intervention is, uh, is going to be critical. If the patient has never been treated or has experienced uh, treatment that has not been effective in the past. And, and so, uh, um, you know, We'd certainly like it to be sort of tier one and, and available immediately. Um, some providers may try other alternatives, you know, in, in their clinical decision making um, before they reach out to this. Uh, we're trying to uh, make it as readily available to our membership and, uh, and once again, expose as many providers to the benefits that, uh, that we are seeing. And I really think that's that's part of the education and outreach. We really see ourselves as complementary with with other uh, interventions and and not as competitive. Um, you know, you, you can you can certainly say we have our biases. Um, we think, in my own cl you know clinical experience, um, is it's a very safe intervention. Uh, it can be done at home, and we would really kind of see it as uh, optimal really kind of in the early stages before this becomes a really life impairing condition. What we know is that the longer you suffer from panic or PTSD, the more likely you are to develop other uh, psychiatric comorbidities, major depression in particular, substance use. Um, and so we think as a very safe intervention uh, that uh, we ought to be closer to the front end of, uh, of available options rather than after multiple treatment failures uh, because the safety profile is so good and the efficacy is, is, is so strong. Um, but then there's a lot of provider education uh, that we need to do out there to let them know that we're an available option and can work collaboratively with, uh, with professionals. Uh, I'll also briefly say uh, there's a question that came up about uh, about uh, you know follow along products, uh, I mentioned before uh, that we have an, an app that we make available to uh, individuals uh, so that they can uh, use the pace breathing modality uh, you know post treatment, uh, and we can make that available to anybody who's completed treatment uh, and then can really kind of use that. 
on really fairly rare occasion, we have people who have been successfully treated who start to have symptoms again, uh, and we can arrange for a, uh, a second treatment episode if, if they prefer. And it looks like we're close to wrap up here. We are. Thank you. Thank you so much. And for any questions that have, have not gotten answered, we will certainly uh, review them and, and try to reach out to those that have asked those questions. And we are up against the clock. So to our speakers, we thank you for that great presentation and for sharing your thoughts. And thank you to the audience for participating in today's webinar. This concludes today's presentation. Thank you again, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much.